Hello, and welcome to the second episode of A Taste of China, an online program that pairs taste with place to explore China's vast culinary landscape. I'm Dinda Elliott, the Director of Programs at China Institute, and I'm honored, very honored, to be here with my dear friend, Mei Zhang, the founder of Wild China, who are our partners in this wonderful series. Each episode of this series takes us to a different part of China. And today we're traveling to Ningxia in North Central China. The Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region is um, for the Hui people who are among the 56 officially recognized ethnic nationalities of China. There you see a map, there it is kind of in the center of China. Um, China is home to approximately 20 million Hui people, roughly 20% of whom live in Ningxia. Uh, most Hui are Chinese speaking practitioners of Islam, which, which entered China centuries ago along the Silk Road. And you can see along here, we're showing you some pictures of just how absolutely beautiful Ningxia is. Uh, many of the Hui people follow Islamic dietary laws and reject the consumption of pork, the most common meat, meat consumed in China, which has allowed them to develop their own distinct variations on Chinese cuisine, which we'll hear a little bit about later. Um, there you see the Great Wall of China winding its way through Ningxia. So the population of Ningxia is majority Han Chinese, but Hui Muslims make up about a third of, of the entire population. They're descendant, descendants of Arab traders who entered China some 1500 years ago. And the Hui pride themselves on having thoroughly assimilated into Chinese society. Um, so unlike the Uyghurs, the Hui have no distinct language. They speak Mandarin and sometimes some Arabic. Um, in the meantime, Ningxia, as you can see, is incredibly beautiful. Uh, and when I spoke to Emma Gao, who we're gonna to talk to in a little while, um, a few days ago, she said, uh, Ningxia has Hulan Mountain, it's got lakes, it's got rice, it's got desert, and it's got blue sky and birds. So I will say that Ningxia is also one of the least populated parts of China. Um, so it's, there are plenty of places to explore as a traveler. So at the end of this episode, we're gonna take questions from the audience. So please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen as we go along. And today's episode focuses on wine, I'm happy to say. So depending on where you're tuning in from, please feel free to join us for a glass <laughs> while you listen. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, May. Cheers. And so May, let me turn it over to you to tell us a bit more and to tell us why we're here tonight. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, Dinda. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Dinda, for setting the stage uh, already way into Ningxia. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Zhang Mei. I'm the founder of Wild China, and welcome to this series of Taste of China, a special Wild China on-air series co-produced with China Institute. Right? Since we can't travel, that's what Wild China does most of the time, uh, we thought, why don't we bring China to you? So I'm thrilled uh, to be co-hosting this session with my dear friend, Dinda. Now, on to wine. Today we're talking about grape wine, not baijiu, which my brothers love. But that stuff is very strong. Those are distilled from grain, rice, barley, wheat, or sorghum. And baijiu burns your throat. So we're not talking about that. Grape wine consumption is a new phenomenon in China. It has grown dramatically in China since the economic reforms of 1980s, right? We've all heard of the early stories of Chinese officials pouring Coca-Cola into a glass of Rothschild to make it palatable. Well, that image is of a bygone era. And aside from the dramatic change in consumption, Chinese wine production is even more surprising. So today we will explore in two parts. Dinda will lead a conversation uh, with a wine expert, Janet Wang. And after that, we will tour a winery in Ningxia. Dinda, I'll hand back over to you. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so Janet, please feel free to turn on your camera now. And I will say that Janet Wang may just be the world's leading expert on Chinese wine. Um, she is an educator, a speaker, and a consultant on Chinese fine wines, spirits, 
Chinese wine culture and the global wine market. And Janet is the author of The Chinese Wine Renaissance, A Wine Lover's Companion, which came out in 2019. I have to add that Janet is joining us from the UK where it is now 2 a.m. in the morning. And so Janet, you are absolutely amazing. We are so grateful to have you. Thank you for waking up in the middle of the night for this fantastic, crazy show. We're very glad to have you. Thank you, Dinda. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so you're a real champ. Um, so Janet, before we jump into the region of Ningxia, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this industry. Um, how did you become such an expert on Chinese wine? All right. Um, so initially, my interest in wine really started, um, well, actually quite young, right? If we go all the way back to uh, when I was a child, you know, with a uh, Chinese parents, as you can imagine, you know, I got taught a lot of Chinese poetry as a child. And I just noticed um, that wine was a very frequent uh, theme through uh, Chinese literature and uh, old, uh, you know, classical poetry. So I was really fascinated about how wine could be um, um, this um, device in literature, you know, no matter if people are talking about sadness or happiness, uh, parting or uniting, um, wine seems to be a, a common feature. So I was always uh, fairly interested in this concept of wine. And then I really started to learn about wine um, at university. So I did my undergraduate years in Cambridge. And at Cambridge, you know, all the colleges have their own cellar. And we had a lot of um, uh, wine dinners with, the, with, with our professors, you know. So I, I got a more formal introduction to wine during universities. And after that, I worked in London at Citigroup um, in European energy. And throughout that period, I uh, just really by chance, I um, got to know some uh, Bordeaux producers and wine producers from France and Spain, Italy. Um, and this was the period in 2008 and nine. And you may know that uh, Chinese uh, consumers were starting to buy a lot of Bordeaux wine. There was a huge interest in Bordeaux. And so through uh, certain conversations, um, I became very um, interested um, in how the uh, Bordeaux winemakers were communicating to the Chinese uh, market, which was very new at that time. Um, and I just noticed how um, a lot of these wine language or philosophies um, of the winemakers, they speak very well to certain philosophies uh, uh, in, in China, you know. So for example, in France, they have this prize term terroir, you know, uh, to indicate the somewhereness or uniqueness of the land. But in Chinese, we have this concept of feng tu, right? So suddenly through the language of wine, you know, you find French people and Chinese people talking about very similar con cultural concepts. Um, you know, they might not share the same language or even anything in common, but through the love of wine, they could understand the same concept in their own, own, own way. So I found that aspect of wine very fascinating. And then, um, Again, by chance, <laughs> I tasted some Chinese wines at um, uh, um, um, a Vin Expo at, uh, in, in France. And I was amazed by the quality and the diversity of the Chinese wine um, being shown there. And I started to uh, get really interested in understanding and uh, talking about uh, more about Chinese wine, you know. So um, I decided to focus more on this uh, cultural concept of wine, you know, communicating about wine uh, to between cultures, and then also with a focus on uh, uh, telling the story of China through the wine narrative. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the book I started writing in 2012, and then right. it came out last so, year. Yeah. So, a question: I think lots of people think that China's the wine culture of today is something completely new and it's entirely imported from the West. Um, but in fact, Chinese wine cultivation uh, really goes back centuries, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because in your introduction, you mentioned the Silk Road, you know, and Ningxia's uh, um, was part of uh, en route, right? A part of the Silk Road. So really um, Western style, wine and grape varieties came to China through the Silk Road in the second century BC. So uh, during Han Dynasty, you know, Han, the emperor uh, Wu Di of Han himself uh, was very keen to 
uh, play around with viticulture himself. So he planted grapes, he was a winemaker himself. So since Han Dynasty, right, that's second century BC, um, through the Silk Road, um, wine got introduced to China. And we're talking about European style, uh, European varieties. And ever since then, you know, throughout the dynasties, you'll find literary uh, references. A lot of poets write about grape wine in particular, you know, and we know like Lady Yang, one of the four greatest beauties of China, she was very partial to grape wine in particular. There's lots of uh, poetry uh, about her. And then we've got this really famous Chinese poem, the opening line, every Chinese person knows, right? Pu Tao Mei Jiu Ye Guang Bei. Right, so by Wang Han, um, another Tang Dynasty poet. So you can you can really what, see. So what does that What does that line of the poem oh. mean? <laughs> so it means a uh, grape wine glistening um, in the glass of evening light. So it's quite a beautiful image, right? And it mentions very specifically uh, grape and wine. From, and that was yeah. from Tang, Tang Dynasty. But yeah, that's Tang Dynasty uh, that, uh, by Wang Han. Uh, mm -hmm. talking about frontier soldiers enjoying grape wine, you know, as a boost to morality on the frontier. So you can see by wow. that time already how popular and how widely available grape wine was, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then throughout various dynasties, Song Dynasty and Yuan Dynasty, especially with the expansion uh, of the Mongol Empire, again, a lot of tributes um, of grape wine came from further west, right, into China as tributes uh, to Beijing. Um, and then Tang Dynasty, again, we have this, the longest reigning emperor of China, Kangxi, he drank Bordeaux wine every day <laughs> uh, with his meal. Yeah. And he, he was the longest um, reigning uh, monarch <laughs> in China. So mm -hmm. this association between health and wine um, was long established, but again, you know, it keeps on getting reinforced, especially when you have an emperor. <laughs> wow, who, um, that's amazing. Yeah. I did not know that Kangxi was a wine <laughs> drinker. Yes, uh, yes. No, so no. then, of course, wine, okay, so we know that in, you know, more recent history, wine essentially disappeared in China, grape wine, but then, so yeah. starting in the 80s, tell us a little bit about how it first, um, you know, came back and, yeah. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit last time about wine as a status symbol and all that kind uh, of stuff then tell, bring us to where we are today. Yeah, so what I find really interesting about the wine culture of China is that it does, it is quite cyclical, you know, unlike, unlike food or tea, where you have a fairly continuous type of uh, culture, wine culture does get disrupted, you know, during periods of upheaval, etc. You know, like you say, wine did disappear for a bit because the uh, imperial uh, China fell, uh, you know, Qing Dynasty was the last dynasty and then China went through a period of turmoil with semi-colonialism and civil war, etc. So um, it's only really until the 80s, as you said, that with the reform and opening up with the economy starting to recover, that we're starting to see this renaissance of Chinese wine, right? So in the 80s, you had the reform and opening up where uh, you had joint ventures, you know, between Raymond Martin and uh, uh, Tianjin uh, food group to form dynasty and great war. Um, um, so you started to see this uh, wine industry coming back. And then in the 90s, the government started to really um, um, advocate for people to drink more grape wine as a slightly healthier alternative, you know, because baijiu is very uh, fierce, right? So grape wine is a lower alcohol uh, option. Mm -hmm. And also the government started to recognize that in places such as Ningxia, right, the, where the soil is um, fairly poor, really, it's not really a fertile land, right, and the lands were being lost to uh, the, the Gobi Desert. So the government decided that actually viticulture um, it is an excellent um, industry to promote, uh, to help um, um, uh, rejuvenate the economy, right? To push sustainability, uh, farm agriculture. Uh, so, you know, so wine played into all these themes, right? And um, so in the 90s, you started to see uh, certain regions um, uh, really uh, 
putting more effort and local incentives into the wine industry. And of course, you know, with wine, it takes time uh, for, for it to, to come to fruition. Mm. So it's only in, in the last 10 years or so, you started to uh, notice Chinese wine uh, being of high quality, you know, winning international accolades and started to be exported. Um, yeah, so, so and, and now, you know, more people are, uh, within China are seeking out Chinese wines. You know, we, we, we have this slogan, uh, the Chinese wine for Chinese people. <laughs> so you're starting to, um, uh, to see the beginning um, of a domestic market. Well. Yeah, so, so before we yeah. actually go to Ningxia, which we'll do in a couple of minutes, but, sure. but I wanted to um, ask you to tell us a little bit more about the kind of beginning of connoisseurship in China. So it started, uh -huh. You know, China goes through all of these, does everything fast, right? So right. <laughs> you go from China being sort of, you know, nouveau riche and people not understanding wine yeah. to cut suddenly, you know, very quickly. Absolutely. Chinese yeah. becoming very, very sophisticated and becoming, you know, the purchasers of the most expensive wines, et cetera. But how, how did it happen? I think you said it started yeah. with Bordeaux, right? Yeah, so it's very interesting because, um, through some of my interactions with producers in Bordeaux, one thing they mentioned to me was, you know, um, part of the reason that Bordeaux kind of started this craze for uh, grape wine. Um, initially, of course, with the relationship between Hong Kong and the UK, UK being one of the main market for Bordeaux, right? UK essentially made the name of Bordeaux. Um, <laughs> and with the link between Hong Kong and the UK, Bordeaux was uh, fairly popular in Hong Kong for a while. And then once um, Hong Kong uh, was returned to China, again, you know, that this mainland link was more pronounced, right? So you're starting to see um, the mainland um, um, taking on more of the lifestyles of what has been happening in Hong Kong. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so there's a sort of a filtering process, but also another thing which is of interest that the Bordeaux producers mentioned, they said, although mainland was quite a new market to them, they found the Chinese palate to be fairly sophisticated because the Chinese food culture is so rich. So Chinese people are very um, quick at picking up these wine concepts, you know, like balance, uh, you know, even the tannic profile, um, although you know, with Chinese food, generally lower, softer tannic profile would go with Chinese food. But the Chinese palate understands uh, tannins and its importance in wine, for example. So they found that very fascinating. Although it's a new market, but the palate is a sophisticated one, right? So, so, um, and of course, Chinese people once they are interested in something, they want to learn about it. They really really seek out knowledge right and you can see that wsct um uh, the wine and uh, spirit education trust um the largest foreign market is china and it's growing exponentially so um there's a lot of desire to learn and understand and uh, with chinese wine domestically produced chinese wine at the fine wine spectrum you know we're not talking about the mass produced yeah. stuff but at the fine wine end actually it is interesting that uh, it's first taken up mostly by connoisseurs right who have um already experienced um, wines from different wine regions and they want to know what china is producing um at the fine wine category and yeah so so the interest actually starts at the sort of the connoisseur level and filters through right so a lot of these finer examples of chinese wines probably initial initially find markets in hong kong or um or japan or east asia for example mm -hmm. um and then if filters back to 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 the wider um uh, market for example and yeah, and many of these uh, wines are winning awards um, internationally and being praised in the UK, you know, because I can see a lot of that happening in the UK. And then it gets feedback, <laughs> fed back into China. Yeah. So you certainly no longer see people pouring Coca-Cola in glass. <laughs> I haven't seen it. <laughs> I've, I seen it. I've, I've seen it. I've heard about it. But I've sure. definitely seen it. <laughs> 
But so, okay, so that. we're about to go to Ningxia. So help set the stage for a moment for Ningxia. Yeah. Um, sure. What is special about the region in terms of wine? Why did it become a center for wine production? And then we'll actually go and have a chat. Yeah. Wine. Yeah, it's very interesting because Ningxia is really now the poster child of the wine industry of China. It's, it's the most recognized name when, it, when you talk about Chinese wine to an international audience. Ningxia is the first province that will come to people's mind. And I think part of it is because it, it was one of the provinces that I recognized quite early on. So back in 94 and 96, you know, the government, local government was already very serious about pushing um, this wine industry um, and offered a lot of um, incentives and support packages uh, to go along with uh, attracting investment, right? So Ningxia being a part of the Silk Road, it had a historical um, a legacy of winemaking. And, you know, you, you can read ancient literature to know that Ningxia was a wine region. And therefore, I think, you know, um, the government, when they recognize actually this could be a way to um, help this uh, traditionally quite a poor region of China um, to develop um, a really unique industry, right? So, so there's land incentives, you know, as you know, in China, you cannot own farmland, right? So the lease on the land tend to be quite short, right? But Ningxia promoted longer leases, for example, and um, incentives, uh, subsidies for, uh, for um, planting the vines um, and lots of subsidies with utilities and all the infrastructure projects were supported. So it's, uh, yeah, so it, it became a really attractive province uh, to, for people to to uh, to to experiment, right? So people who had passion <laughs> in this field or who were early adopters, I suppose, um, found Ningxia to be the the place to go, right? To to try it out, um, and that incentive uh, system has been well implemented and supported and continued, you know. And that's important because wine is something that you have to invest decades you know of resources and time and, mm -hmm. and it has been carried through and 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 that's why you know today um you know all, all the hard work <laughs> you know, all the seeds were sown back in the early 90s and it is only kind of in recent years you're starting to see um see some positive results yeah um fantastic yeah, so, fantastic yeah. That is so great. So I think I think the time has come for us to actually go to Ningxia. You've set the stage perfectly. And um, but Janet, I hope you'll stay with us. I, you know, why don't you? Um, we, you and I can turn our cameras off, but stay with us because we want to come back and bring you back. Uh, you know, after we have another chat. So I'm going to hand it back over to um, to May, and um, who she's going to bring on our next guest. Thank you so much, Dinda and Janet. Janet, you literally expanded my time horizon. Think of China, if you look at it since the 1980s, it's a completely different picture from when you look at it over the past 2000 years. Now I will never forget, Kanshi is a wine drinker. Anyway, thank you. I'm delighted to welcome our second guest, Emma Gao, who is the owner and winemaker of Silver Heights Vineyard in Ningxia. And she's there on site right now. Emma, could you join us uh, in camera, mm -hmm. on camera? Let's see. Hi. Hi, May. How beautiful <laughs> is that? Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, me... Good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Let me say a few words uh, about Emma to introduce her to uh, the audience. And then I'd love to go with you and take a look where you are. So, Thank Emma. You so much. Yeah, grew up in a, and her vineyard is there. Her father yeah, sent her off. Yes, her father sent her to study wine in Bordeaux almost 20 years ago, that was, right? And she returned with a wine degree from France, but a single degree was not enough to answer the skepticism. What kind of wine can Chinese make? So Emma is a true entrepreneur, a female entrepreneur, and by the way, Four women talking about wine here. Uh, isn't that wonderful? Emma is the true entrepreneur who overcame difficulties to make a dream come true. Uh, in 2007, Emma and her family launched Silver Heights and the production grew from 
3,000 bottles back then to 200,000 bottles 2020. That is a staggering 30% compounded annual growth rate based on my calculation. Simply amazing. Well done, Emma. So anyway, <laughs> welcome. Thank you for taking the time. Now, uh, I'll turn the camera to you. Tell us where you are and what stage of production. Okay. Thank you very much, Mary, for With your wines. Great. Uh, thank you, and welcome to everyone. To uh, I'm glad to show you where uh, we are in Ningxia uh, on the foothill of the Holland Mountain. So we're just now in the vineyard. I show you a little bit around. Uh, <laughs> so those is our vineyard. Now it's the autumn season. <clears throat> so the leaves are getting shut down. Then we just finished the harvest. We made several varieties like a uh, uh, Chardonnay, Sangiovese, uh, Riesling, then uh, uh, not Sangiovese, Italian Riesling, then uh, Merlot Cup, Sauvignon, and the Syrah Pinot Noir. Started uh, 18th uh, August uh, until just finished yesterday. <laughs> 18th of August and just filled yesterday. Okay. Our guest, welcome to Ningxia and some corner for. I exercise also my uh, octograph. <laughs> yeah, so here we go. Uh, so let me introduce myself. I'm Emma Gao, native here in Tang of Ningxia. I born here in Yinchuan. Then my father sent me to uh, study oenology because he's a visioner about this uh, potential region because we have the lot of sunshine. You can see this is the early morning, 9, 9 a.m. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Then uh, we, we try to create this vineyard, not only the, vi uh, the vines, but also the surrounding the trees and some animals as well to create an uh, ecosystem. Yeah, because when we landed here, it was a uh, virgin land, never be explored. So we don't want to po po make any pollution or human interaction to the nature. It's so beautiful. It's an old history, ancient rocky soil. So we wish to have a beautiful expression of Ningxia land. I'll make some awesome one to share with whole world. <laughs> so we have some animals as well. Have uh, horses, they are ramping somewhere eating grasses, but we're not going to see that. First, we're going to the cellar. I'll show you where it's the uh, winemaking area. We have bought some bottles for bottles so, um, our entry level one lost the warriors. This is a little bit garden where our staff living here, our employee living here. <laughs> yeah. uh, the ground we can harvest as well. This is our very modest uh, cell, uh, one making area. That young gentleman is an intern <laughs> who is making something up. You know, making red wine is a lot of work. And it, it's a uh, kind of hard work actually. Show you a little bit. Can you see? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, so uh, then we're going to press the one with this very, uh, uh, very kind of traditional way of pressing one for red. Um, then later we eat them in the breaks. <laughs> That's all. Can I uh, can I show you also some animals we have? Have hundreds, more than hundreds of sheep. You know, for organic uh, the biodynamic method, we should have some manure of uh, animals to do compost. Then we put also uh, biodynamic preparations to turn them to like a zhong yao cai de yao yin zi. You can understand my Chinese. Uh, then to kept the energy from the whole universe, planet. I'm not going to the cell underground because we don't have the Wi-Fi over there. We don't have the connection over there, but this uh, is the top of cell. We have a beautiful garden, wide garden here, some tree uh, for protecting the hot temperature from the summertime. 
<laughs> Lovely, Emma. Thank you so much. Thank I was you. there in the summer, and it looks very different right now. It just shows right. Ningxia's weather is very different, right? Ningxia also gets bitterly cold in winter time, as I understand, which is very different from Bordeaux, from Napa, where I am. So, yeah. Excuse me. What do you have to do differently to produce these amazing wines there? Uh. The difference is we are in a very extreme condition of climate. Can be very cold when summer uh, in uh, winter time, minus 25. It's near to the border of China. It's near to the uh, Mongolia, you know, very north. Uh, then we have a very, uh, not very hot summer, uh, around 30 degree temperature during the summertime. And we have, um, Big sunshine because we're on the altitude of 1,200 meters above. Um, 1,200 meter above altitude. Then very cool night. The breeze of cool wind spreading in the vineyard to keep the acidity to to let them grow uh, slowly to to concentrate their colors and the flavors. And the soil. It's a lot of rocks, so it's a minerality of this uh, region can be of a wine. Let's go back for tasting some wine, if you wish. Lovely. <laughs> With some ninja food. Lovely. And so um, most people would say, when you drink Chinese, uh, when you eat Chinese food, you drink white wine. I'm sure you found like a thousand different ways to break that mode. Tell us how to pair your wines with Chinese food. Um, I know it paired, goes really well with Western food, but do you pair with Ningxia food, the mutton or any of the local dishes? All right, so I prepared something for you. <laughs> That's a uh, shou zhua yang rou. And some salad. Oh, well. <laughs> Let me put the oil uh, in a right way. So it's not very good to present because we don't have a professional restaurant here. It's made in home. <laughs> you can see here's two, uh, one famous ninja dish with some green, uh, white. <clears throat> uh, Yara flower leaves made salad. Mm -hmm. You can see well. Uh -huh. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a breakfast actually. <laughs> so, so mm -hmm. Yangru actually is very famous dish in Ningxia because it's uh, uh, how to say, uh, mountain side. We have uh, the sheep in this area is quite common. Then they eat the herbs in a um, different way because on the mountain, here's a lot of wild herbs. It's also used for Chinese medicine, like a gan cao, liquor rice, uh, like some wild flowers, local flowers. So the meat are not smell like mutton. <laughs> Let me try. Can I try? Of course. Enjoy. Yeah, you just see your hand. Then, mmm, wow. that's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the dish, uh, Ningxia people, and also in, in the Mongolia, I believe, right? It's called hand pulled mutton. Right, because in old time we don't have any uh, <clears throat> sophisticated table set for eat in the desert in the steppes, so everyone has a. Uh, uh, very single tent and just cook a big, big casserole of meat and feed for whole family of soldiers that come from. But we also, besides that, we also have the barbecue of mutton, which is delicious. Kind of uh, yang rou chuar, zemme shuo? Uh, lamb skewers. Yeah, lamb skewers. Where come from? Because in the ancient time, here's a lot of war between border of China and Mongolia. So the soldiers has nothing to eat, but they have some sheep in the white place. So they use their 
。剑怎么说 ？Sword. 剑。Sword. Sword. Yeah, they use their sword to 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 make some uh meat on it and cook for the soldiers. Soldiers. Yeah. So the the the, the very famous dish and sword in Ningxia from the tradition. And those one, it's really organic things. Ku ku tai. How do you say that? Ku tai is kind of um. Yeah. <laughs> 忘记了，就有点像那个蒲公英，蒲公英，蒲公英。It's a kind of wild、uh, herb. Yeah, I forgot the English word for it. But you harvest、okay. it. It's a little bit bitter, right? Yeah. Right. And so you drink red wine or white wine with these dishes? Oh, uh, yeah. Usually we put aside that, but、uh, with meat, always with the red one. But you can also try with white one, because in in China we have a lot of spice for fish, and so you can put soy soya for the fish. So you not necessarily、um, pour the white one for fish. You can also take some light red one for a、uh, Chinese style fish.、Mm. Very nice. That's a, yeah, that is a great last verse to pair. This kind of salad, it's a little bit spicy with uh, uh, peppers with um,、uh, uh, coriander. So that's for this Sauvignon Blanc Italian Riesling aromatic wine. <laughs> yeah, because Ningxia has a great、uh, sunshine for ripe、uh, for ripening the red grapes, but also the cool night. And the minerality of the soil keeps the acidity. So our white wine actually is most sophisticated. By the way, our white wine is、uh, rated by、uh, international wine critics Jensis Robinson from London, Janet, <laughs>、uh, high rated. Then we serve it as、uh, state dinner two times with uh, uh, President of France, French King last year. Our Xi Da Da use our white wine to serve <laughs> Chinese white wine to serve this state dinner. So we're proud of our work and proud of、uh, region. Cheers. Cheers! Congratulations! I know your、uh, famous Emma's Reserve 2011, a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, was awarded 91 points by Robert Parker, right? And he even mentioned it has a taste, a hint of goji berry, which is very Ningxia. Now, Emma, could you tell us? Because in China, wine production has traditionally been dominated by、uh, state-owned brands like Great Wall Dynasty and all of these. How how do small vineyards compete, and what impact has small vineyards made on the wine in wine production? Yeah, I think China is changing. China is changing in many、uh, things. Today, we we could produce some sophisticated products like、uh, craft, artisanal winemaking. Instead, a big、uh, production,、uh, we can、uh, express our hometown, a、uh, different land, and we protect the environment and in same time to share our uh, uh, hometown's taste, <laughs> China taste. I think that's、uh, meaning of. Uh, what we are doing? Yes, I think you know the family running boutique operations that really sort of perfect the craft of wine making and keeping the vines really beautiful, really tasty, is is an amazing <laughs> effort, right?、Um, thank you. One last question before we open up for discussion is: aside from wines, I personally only went to Ningxia recently. I found it absolutely stunning and beautiful. You, as a resident there, give us three reasons. Why we should visit Ningxia, or what you、mm. love about it? Well, Ningxia is a beautiful, precious、uh, little province, but you have mountain,、uh, Yellow River,、uh, to look and the sunset beside of Yellow River with the lovers all along. It's amazing. <laughs> you <laughs> have <very> French, <laughs> right? We have a lot of lakes. So the birds immigrate、uh, every year, pass by the lakes. Uh, uh, we have more than four hundred different kind of white birds during some season to look, to look and take pictures. And、uh, also desert, 
Yeah, you can take your sports activities. You know, here's a big uh, event uh, in Xionghui, Hero uh, Conference, which is uh, for the karting, ATV, full <laughs> uh, forwards, cars, even avion. The show, they come over more than a million people comes from uh, international areas. They come to the desert to show their equipment, to show their techniques, have fun, lot, lot of music festival in this area. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Can't wait to go there. Now, thank you, Emma. Please stay on the line and let me invite Dinda and Janet back to uh, have a conversation. Let's all catch up and enjoy the wine. I'll hand over to you, Dinda. So yeah, just very, very quickly. I, again, you know, Emma, I want to drink a toast to you. You are amazing. I wish my wine is not as good as your wine is, but <laughs> don't they? <laughs> also want to drink a toast to Janet, who's sitting there in the middle of the night in London. Yes. Um, say thank you, and I do love the fact that four women talking about four women talking about wine. Isn't that great? So here's to here's to all of you. Cheers. Cheers. I thank will you. Also I will also say that, Emma, I think you are amazing because um, I learned when I spoke to you that English is actually your fourth language. Your first language is Chinese. Your second language is Russian because you studied for five years in St. Petersburg. Your third language is French, of course, uh, because you studied for many years there. And your fourth language is English. I mean, that's just amazing, just amazing. So you are both, um, I think you both sort of epitomize the kind of entrepreneurial and open-minded spirit of a new generation of people from China. It's just so exciting. It's really great to, to have you here. I can't help but comment on your flowers, Emma. Last time when I visited her, she said, oh, let's drink some wine. And then she told her staff, Make sure you put some flowers, some roses there. This is the beauty of women drinking wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Emma, I do have a question, which is, are, who are the people mostly who drink your wine? Is it very, very sophisticated, um, wealthy people in the big cities of China or who, who is drinking your wine? Yeah, we started to uh, list our wine to the most uh, uh, pre prestigious hotel and restaurant in Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou, on, uh, on the bond of Shanghai, uh, Hyatt, Hyatt Group, Shangri-La, then Kavinsky, Kavinsky Hotels, wow. uh, Amman Resorts, yeah, a lot of Michelin restaurants. And now we export more than 15 countries, like in London as well. Yeah, our wine even served in London for uh, a more Jeanette present one time for <laughs> China one tasting, then also Mossiman uh, restaurant, which is uh, like a gentleman member club uh, restaurant. So we are very lucky to work with professional wine distributors in every country. They put the value of Ningxia uh, Super Heights wines to proper place. So professional sommelier can serve the wine in proper way for share. But we also sell in some uh, wine stores in Canada or other countries. Um, certainly in Florida or Africa. <laughs> You know, we're happy to present a bottle of Chinese wine in uh, some uh, important tables. Yeah. Emma, could Thank you hold you. the wine to the camera? There's a question who wants to see your label. Oh, great. <laughs> I think we, all want, to, we all want to buy it. <laughs> yeah, let me show. This is our flagship summit. Summit uh, uh, in Chinese Pico Silver Heights. Uh, why Silver Heights? Because that's my dog, and uh, I'll show you. <laughs> Naughty dogs always with. Uh, uh... <laughs> Don't we all want to go live there? It's yeah. so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, fighting together, you know. <laughs> it's a family, of course, they are very strong. <laughs> 
Now, Emma, yeah. there's a question. Where can we purchase Ningxia wines in United States? Is it oh, already yeah. imported in stores? Uh, actually, we're going to be uh, in Florida soon. Florida. Our expo manager is just uh, got the conclusion with them. They try the one, they're happy to try the first pallet. <laughs> we're probably the first Chinese wine export to the US. Wow, really? <laughs> yeah. So, so Janet, I'm also curious to hear, um, you know, what are some of the other, there are a number of areas of China where, that are making good wine, right? Where, yeah. where, in your mind, where are the most exciting areas? Is it Ningxia or what, what's? Yeah, I, I love Ningxia because um, first of all, you know, they have started to um, really identify with the land, you know, because as you probably know, with a lot of these new world regions, you go through this rite of passage. You first want to make a Bordeaux blend, you know, to to almost <laughs> um, um, make a wine that tastes like a Bordeaux or French wine, right? That's sort of the first step to show that you can make a serious wine. But then afterwards, when you started to um, develop your own style, uh, you start to showcase um, the character of the land, you know, like Emma, well, Emma was saying, you know, this is, um, her wine is really about Ningxia, the Ningxia terroir, about her own unique terroir, uh, as they were heights with the height, uh, with the special soil. They've got lots of very complex soil types within silver height. And you can tell, you know, when we taste Emma's wine um, with, um, with the wine critics here in London, they, they would all say, wow, this is obviously a Bordeaux blend, but the way they uh, uh, use oak is very deaf, it's very Bordeaux in style, but you can definitely tell this is a wine uh, from somewhere else, right? There's some uniqueness about it. And that's what's really exciting, I think, from, from Ningxia. Some of these winemakers, like, like Emma, um, is really starting to express their terroir and their personality in the wine. So I think Ningxia, for, for sure, um, it is a really exciting place. Um, beside Ningxia, there are also some wine regions which are showing a lot of promise. Uh, Yunnan, again, a very high altitude uh, wine region, uh, because Yunnan, you know, is southwest China, right? So um, when you are that far south, you have to go up in height uh, to get the, uh, the, the, the um, climate, um, otherwise it's too hot. But um, so Yunnan, for example, is interesting. And then you have other regions like um, uh, Hebei that's developing Longyan as a, a fairly special grape variety, uh, a white wine uh, variety. So I personally, uh, I'm really interested to, to see Chinese wines made with interesting varieties, either Chinese or hybrids or uh, something that show character in the Chinese soil. It could be European variety that just does particularly well or differently in Chinese soil. Um, so. Basically, I think Chinese wines with Chinese characteristics is what's exciting for the future, for the international um, uh, audience, right? So, yeah. Mm. I have a technical question. If the temperature freezes, like in Yunnan, where I'm from, and Ningxia, what do you do with the vines? Wouldn't, what do you do with them? Yeah, so I'm sure Emma can tell you more detail, but they, they do bury the vine. So it, one is the coldness and also the dryness. So the combination of very cold winter and dry and brittle condition will, um, you, the vines cannot survive that. So in places like Ningxia and many parts of China uh, in winter, they have to bury the vines. Um, so I don't know when Emma's gonna do that in her vineyard, but I would imagine um, you know, that's the next thing she'll be thinking about. So they have to bury it in winter and then in springtime, they have to unbury it again. So actually you can imagine this is highly labor intensive. Uh, so Chinese wines made in this way, you know, they, they, they are quite costly. <laughs> you know, they, there's a lot of work, um, yeah. So we do have, we have a few more photographs of, um, of Emma's Vineyard. So let's show those as well. It's just so beautiful. And while, but we'll, we can keep chatting, um, you know, while we look at these photographs. But look at that. That's the so Emma. That's the Hulan Mountain, right? Right. That's our new uh, new winery uh, built. But we we're going to move next year. 
It's just beautiful. Can you host <laughs> guests for overnight stay now, Emma? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you... Sorry. Can you can can guests stay on your vineyard now? Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. We have a a villa for stay some days yes we have few rooms as well so you can have enjoyment 24 hours or more to see the sunset a beautiful sunrise and the stars in Ningxia. Yes. okay while well, uh, while china guests are fine. coming and we want your wine and your lamb and the yarrow vines <laughs> <laughs> it looks See, like you've got lots of women cool. working there as well yeah, those uh, the women they are very uh, take care of the vines because they are most uh, delicate. They do a lot of delicate tests. It's only the precision can make the things right. They are uh, humble, uh, smaller, and the supple can be uh, stand up or uh, <clears throat> or uh, down uh, to down earth to take care of the earth, you know, for a lot of work, you have to move your body very up away. <laughs> really? I would never, I would never know that about wine. So, so it requires very delicate work with your fingers or what? Yes, because the vines, you they are naturally on the ground uh, because yeah. they are lying, uh, lian, the lian, they're not trees. Yeah. So you need to uh, help them on the uh, iron ware. Yeah. Then you yeah, yeah. To, uh, yeah. You need to print them. Need to uh, to uh, take out some extra bunches of leaves for better aeration mm -hmm. to uh, limit uh, uh, risk of the future disease uh, when it's emit. Then you <clears throat> we control the production not too much. So the little fingers to take care of all of these things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great photograph. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not used to makeup, but that one is too much. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like so, a lady farmer, right? <laughs> So there is, I do see another question, someone who's really interested in, in the details of winemaking. Um, someone is asking about the terroir of, of Nisa, what makes it so unique and how it's different from the terroir of Bordeaux. Um, can you talk a little bit about the climate and the rainfall? Uh, um, <laughs> she's gone to chase the dogs. <laughs> But yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about the unique terroir of Ningxia? And and would you say that, you know, if I tasted a glass of wine from Ningxia, is it very obviously it has a different taste from a wine from a different region of China? I'm sure, Janet, you also have an opinion about that, but. Yeah, we're trying to figure out, actually. Since 12 years, I made one. Uh, I still young uh, young winemaker and it's still a baby, but we try uh, different varieties. Uh, uh, almost twenty varieties: Malbec from Argentina, uh, Pinot Noir from Burgundy uh, shows uh, potential. Chardonnay we uh, already proved that is a, a delicate white wine can made here. Then Bordeaux varieties uh, is good. Uh, we we won a lot of award for this Bordeaux blend. Then specific flavor of our wine is uh, a personality of this special special altitude. Uh, it's a high uh, high, uh, high altitude. Then a specialty of this ancient rocks. Not very often we find other places. It's a ride, but in the same time, we have a microclimate because of the Yellow River pass by a lot of water resource because ancient, uh, <clears throat> uh, because this mountain has been to emerge in the water four times. Then here's a, a big fender crop earth creek. We have mosaic of the different uh, soil from different fence. We have uh, um, three blocks of vineyards, then we have uh, four different kinds of soil. So we, 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 um, 
we plant the vines on it and trying to figure out what is the best expression of uh, different kind of varieties. Hmm. So, well, probably talking about wine tasting, so uh, local flowers, white flowers, how to talk, uh, goji berry, <laughs> yellow flowers like a sha zao hua, what we planted surrounded our vineyard. Nice. A lot of, yeah, a lot of uh, smelling very good when springtime, all the flowers blossom. Also, acacia, I don't know in English, acacia, uh, 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 then very Provence, like French Provence herbs, mm -hmm. very strong flavors because it's a little similar uh, plant as well here. So we can find the black olive in our wine as well. Really? Wow. We don't have black olive, but we can find it aromas. <laughs> wow. Yeah, ginger, pepper, uh, rose. Yeah, can be delicate rose with our shirua, hofeng fermented wine, uh, carbonic maceration, then uh, pinot noir as well. A lot of rose, a lot of uh, violet. Then for capsule new, we have uh, uh, blackberries and uh, some kind of herbal note, very cabinet of new uh, smell. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, uh, I think. That in, in Europe, are people, and Janet, maybe you can answer this as well. In Europe, are people starting to realize that China is making some good wines? Yeah, it's starting. Yes. So Emma's wine, you know, is in London <laughs> and Park Chinois yeah. and Mossman. Um, yeah, so and especially, you know, British wine writer community and wine critics are um, very well respected globally, you know, so they are showing great interest in China and a lot of them are writing about China and uh, critiquing about the wines. And of course, you know, um, Emma's wine and among others are winning some of the um, really high profile um, uh, wine trophies, right, in, in London and internationally. So um, they're definitely, yeah, getting a lot of interest. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it takes a bit of time to filter that into the more sort of uh, the consumer, you know, the wider consumer right. um, circles. But at the moment, I think certainly within the wine trade, and among the sort of the connoisseur circles, China is very exciting. You know, it's something that they want to try because I, I do a lot of the uh, wine tasting events and masterclasses here in the UK and we always get a lot of interest. And um, yeah, and I, I have people asking for Emma's wine. <laughs> so yeah, so it, it's very exciting, I think. That's good to hear. Um, yeah. So, you know, we only have a couple more minutes, but but I before I'll send it back to you, May, in a second. But but Emma, first, I want to ask you to tell us a little bit more about which um, Ningxia food you like to eat with your wine. Which which kind of dishes do you like? You So you like the shou dua yang rou, right? You like the hand yeah. grab button. And what else do you like to eat with your with your wine? I like mostly what my mother cooked. And my sister, my sister is really uh, uh, had the had the uh, DNA of cooking uh, skills from my grandmother and my mother. So she has a restaurant. We mostly like to go there generally together for family. Wow, a lot of recipes. Yeah. What kind of what <laughs> kind food? of food? What kind of dishes? So always started with all kind of salad. So soja uh, can be soja, can be uh, different kind of veggies, organic veggies, very flavorful. The tomato is amazing in our region because the sunshine, oh. full flavors, yeah. Then uh, aubergine, uh, aubergine, uh, yep. <laughs> yep, 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 eggplant, yep, yep. Eggplant. Then we have a lot of noodles, different kind of it. You can do with knife you can do with the lamy and you can do with uh cutting uh, you can do with hand reading a lot of spaghetti uh western style but yeah. sometimes with uh yeah sometimes it's dry sometimes with some soups for winter time it's delicious 
And what kind um, of wine? What kind of wine would you drink with the noodles? Oh, difficult. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> what kind of noodles? Okay. If I have a little square, but the salted, but the fried noodles. Okay. Uh, then I like to have a rosé, rosé or white one. Because usually it's do with meat and full flavor, a lot of veggies. It's already ve very full palate. So you need something refreshing to clean your palate and to have second taste, yeah. Then for uh, uh, other food can be um, in Chia food. Oh, we have also um, Muslim nation delicious food. Yeah, uh, spicy, yeah. right? A little bit spicy. Uh, no, sometimes yes, but the Ningxia people never cook without tomato and uh, pepperoni. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Always a little bit, yeah, for flavor. Then uh, they have a lot of bread with herbs uh, baked. We can put uh, uh, put some um, uh, 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 some sauce made from tomato like pasta for breakfast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Sounds, sounds wonderful. Sounds wonderful. So I, I want to say um, that Janet, I loved when you said that um, the, I guess it was the winemakers in France that they said that the Chinese have a very sophisticated palate, which is <laughs> so fantastic and that the Chinese can quickly, you know, experience wine in, yeah. a, in a very full way. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. The tasters and the producers, you know, like people like Emma, they, they are doing really um, interesting things. You know, Emma mentioned biodynamic practices and really she's incorporating not just, you know, the European type of biodynamic practices, but also her own understanding of Chinese traditional um calendar you know and uh -huh. Chinese medicine and well-being so um you know she's really pushing the frontiers in, in winemaking in general not just within China but yeah internationally so I think that's what's really exciting is that you know China being a country with this ancient uh, culture and a historical legacy of wine culture although it's little known it means that people you know once they once this thing starts to revive again, you know, you, you will start to see innovation, um, not just um, following well-trodden paths. So um, right. I'm super excited about Chinese wines. <laughs> right. Well, you know, unfortunately, I think that's all, we, that's all the time we have tonight, but I just want to thank you, Janet, and thank you so for getting up in the middle of the night and joining us and for being so brilliant. And thank you, Emma, so much for bringing us all the way to Ningxia. Um, I'm going to hand it back to, to May, but first I just want to say, you know, please, if you liked this show, if you love what you do, these women, please become a member of China Institute. Um, your membership really means a lot because it allows us to bring wonderful speakers like this to our programming. Um, so please do that and and tune in to our next episode, which is going to take us um, all the way to Zhejiang province. But um, so I want to thank you again and hand it back to May. Thank you. I can only echo the appreciation, all the wonderful entrepreneurs, ladies, experts in this field. Thank you for taking the time, Emma, Dinda, and Janet. And um, I'm sorry, Mr. Wang, I know you really want to know Emma's plans for the future and many questions there. You have to come and travel with Wild China. We're going to visit Emma on site and also visit wildchina.com and join our newsletter. We have um, wonderful events like this. So thank you again, everyone, for taking the time. You're wonderful. Thank Take you, care. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.